if you're watching the recording, this should start. Uh, the lecture should start in about seven minutes from this point. It's yeah. Ten participants. Maybe everyone else is fed up.
Hey everyone, well, you have a few minutes here. Uh, just a reminder, uh, the way we want you to be is with your microphone off, but your camera on, it just helps everything. Okay, it's six o'clock. We'll give it about 30 seconds to let the stragglers log in. All of you are very punctual and I do appreciate that. Okay, and I just heard, heard that we lost somebody. So as with everyone else, uh, feel, log out, log in as you have to. Um, I know across Columbus and a bunch of places, uh, internet, uh, connections have been variable. So like there is no shame in logging back in. That's totally fine. Um, it's just, I gotta tell you, if you know any kids in Columbus City Schools this week, it has just been a total wildness of a mess. Um, so I am understanding a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, if you uh, were fortunate slash unfortunate enough to log in last week for our movie, I. I thank you for putting up with that nonsense. I'm sorry that didn't quite work out. Uh, it was probably arrogant of me to think that I wouldn't have the Zoom problem that comes from logging like 100 people into the same call. Sorry about that. Um, with that said, that is a really neat movie uh, that uh, Vice Guide to North Korea, uh, I don't have your, uh, little quizzes for that graded yet, uh, but that should probably happen by Wednesday or so. Um, are there, I think you guys are in good shape in terms of uh, tech issues or errors or whatever. Every week when you teach online brings kind of new little fresh problems, but I think uh, your sections are okay. Um, does anyone have uh, any questions or issues right at the top of the class, though? No? I don't see anyone speaking up for that. Everything's working okay? Okay, uh, good. Um, if you ever, at the beginning of the week, see that uh, the material for the week hasn't self-populated uh, by noon on Monday. Uh, please let me know. Um, that means something has gone wrong. Uh, I'll just give you a behind the scenes. What I do uh, Monday mornings is I go in, just make sure everything's working right. Usually with every class, there's like one minor thing that just needs to be adjusted and things get going. So if things don't look to be in order by noon on Monday, that means there's a problem and I need to fix it. And just send me an email for that. Um, let's take a look at the syllabus is what I think we should do. Uh, our, most of our work today uh, is going to be um, in the presentation angle but it is always healthy to look at the syllabus. So I'll just real quickly take us over there.
Okay. And sharing screen. Cool. So. Move your faces. Okay, you should see the syllabus in Word right now, correct? Yeah, okay. So, last week we, you wrote an essay on the DPRK and uh, you did the exercise. Did I have you write the exercise or do, did I have you write the essay or do the exercise? Can someone remind me? You said that the essay was a typo and there was no essay, okay. so you just did the exercise. Just do the exercise, that's fine. Um, it really depended on the class. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Uh, that's what I said. Uh, so this week is communication. Uh, there's no reason why communication should be bolded there. Uh, that's my fault. Uh, so what you want to do for this week is write a short essay on gender in language and the explanation for that uh, should be on uh, Blackboard for you and then uh, write, do our quick quiz on chapter four. Uh, so the best practice for you there is to um, watch or attend this class and then um, then do a little bit of chapter four and then take the quiz because rem remember you only have 10 minutes to do that. Next week, we're going to do a little essay. I don't have the prompt for that one written yet, but it will basically be the type and someone doesn't, isn't on mute that should be, if you could just make sure you're on mute, that'd be great. Uh, if uh, next week's exercise is going to be apocalypse economy. So like, let's say the world actually ended even more than it has already, which, whatever. Um, what would you do? How would you do it? We all have these kind of ideas in our heads from looking at and watching all of this media about that sort of thing. Well, what would you actually do to like reset the world? Um, it's just an interesting kind of thought exercise. Uh, honestly, there's one thing COVID's shown us uh, more than anything else is that the concept of an apocalypse is just garbage. The world can't end. Uh, bad things just kind of happen. Um, bum, bum, bum. What I was really looking for is uh, this is week four and then week eight is our midterm exam. So we still have a good solid four weeks until our midterms coming up. Um, and then did I give you a midterm? Okay, that's all, as far as we have to go for. So we have a good solid four weeks before our midterm uh, exam. Anyway, enough of this nonsense rambling. Let's just uh, look at our lecture for the day and then shuffle around all my windows because I am a professional, sort of. I really do pity my daughter's um, teacher because he had, the poor guy has like four scientists and like three otherwise professors or like communications experts in his classes. Um, so it's just, Please be patient with everyone. You don't have to be, be patient with me, but be, I guess be patient with those that are especially uncomputer gifted. Okay, so here we are. Here's the PowerPoint that's working, ha ha. Uh, if you were looking earlier in the day for these slides, they were not available, but I did post them about 15 minutes ago. Uh, on to Blackboard. So if you are a follower, a longer, uh, they should be there for you. Uh, today we are talking about communication uh, in a very kind of nuts and bolts way, very at the base level. Uh, so many, uh, so there are like communication departments and communication majors, but they never really talk about the bones of, well, what actually is communication? Uh, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, 
you see the PowerPoint right now, right? Okay, thank you for being patient. So, uh, first we're, we're gonna talk about how we study communication. Then we're gonna talk about ways that humans use words. We're going to talk about dialects and what dialects are and how dialects work. And then we will talk about our culture of the week, which is Russia. Why did I choose Russia when talking about communication? Uh, the fact of the matter is that I studied Russian for three years in high school and it's a foreign language I'm relatively familiar with. Uh, anyone here actually speak Russian? No? Good, because I speak it very poorly. Um, <laughs> if anyone here actually uh, would be fluent in Russian, I would ask them to maybe help me out later on down the road. Uh, I'm familiar enough with Russian to know the language, um, how it works, and know how it works differently from English, which is what I think makes it a really interesting comparison to the English language. And it's so interestingly historically, sociologically, anthropologically, that Russia and the United States have been at odds with each other in the past, are kind of at odds with each other now, because we really are two very different societies, and that difference is actually reflected in um, our languages. Uh, there are societies that um, we are much more different than. Uh, for example, uh, Japanese society or Chinese society is much different from American society, but Russian society is just different enough to uh, make us not get along with them very well at all. It's like that, that person that would be your friend, uh, but there's just those couple things about them that makes your, them your bitter enemy. Anyway, moving on, let's talk about study and communication. So there are many ways to study human communication. Uh, there is kinesthetic, kin uh, and a lot of these words aren't in my speaking vocabulary, they're in my reading vocabulary. Kinestics, I think is how you say that, is the study of body position, movement, facial expression, and gaze. So how we use our bodies to actually communicate. And a lot of these things are hardwired into us. If we all had our cameras off, um, and I knew, I know you can see me, uh, but if you couldn't see me, I still would be using certain body language because that's hardwired into our brains. And it is hardwired into our language. It is part of something how our culture um, communicates. Uh, and that is a really uh, interesting element of human society. Uh, haptics is analysis and study of touch. So one human touching another human. And with so many of these things, and we are being so disrupted in our society right now, you can think about how human interaction is being limited by not really being able to touch other humans right now. Uh, and what that means. And maybe that connection really is what drives some people to be not so safe. That's not an excuse, but it's some, certainly something that happens. Uh, Proxemics is the study of cultural use of interpersonal space. Different societies have different um, uses of space, if it were. Uh, in the United States, we have a relatively, relatively, not giant, but relatively large personal bubble right? The area uh, around our human bodies that we don't want people to get into unless they are very close acquaintances or uh, romantic partners or children, something like that. Um, other than that, we have a pretty big personal bubble. If you lived in India, you would have a much tighter personal bubble, right? Uh, because India, Indian society, even in rural areas, things tend to be much more compact. And that is largely due to the historically and contemporary uh, compaction within uh, Indian urban areas. Um, so that's something you would study with proxemics. Uh, phonology is the sound system of languages. So uh, different languages uh, use sound differently. In the English language, when we're asking a question, uh, the sentence tends to go up like this, right? This makes it sound like I'm asking a question. 
right? It goes up toward the end, right? At least traditionally. Now, um, in uh, the last two decades or so, that's kind of deteriorated a little bit. Uh, if you uh, really uh, get into phonology and other linguistics, that tendency to go up toward the end of a sentence is called um, upspeak, I think is what it's called. Uh, upspeak, vocal fry, uh, these are sometimes seen as um, vocal fry is kind of talking like this. Uh, anyway, not quite, I can't do it quite right. Some people can turn it on and turn it off. Uh, but there are these certain ticks in our languages that move into the language and move out of the language. Sometimes it's seen as being highly undesirable. Other times it's seen as, it could be seen as all, all kinds of things. It could be seen as being kind of sexy, right? Actually, uh, vocal fry in particular um, is, and if you want to achieve uh, example of someone who does vocal fry almost constantly, uh, Kim Kardashian is a real hard vocal fryer. Some people think that the way her voice sounds is, is kind of hot, right? That um, these tonalities are, uh, and what those tonalities mean are all a matter of phonology. Uh, and then linguistics in general, uh, these other terms here, give me, these other terms here are generally outside of the scope of the study of linguistics. Most of what we're talking today is specifically about linguistics. Uh, so uh, the next slide will give us more definitions on that. So there are multiple types of linguistics. We have comparative linguistics, which is the science of documenting the relationships between languages and grouping them into language families. Uh, different languages, uh, and a lot of this stuff, you, if you speak a foreign language or you're familiar with a foreign language, you may already know this so sort of thing. It is easier for G English speakers to learn how to speak French or German because the modern English language is closely grouped with both French and German, right? And the closer you are in groupings linguistically, the easier a language becomes because it follows the same general rules. But a native English speaker, if they spread out globally to places that are traditionally farther away, right? And a lot of this applies to like the ancient world, um, it is harder for a native English speaker to learn how to speak Arabic. It is harder for a native English speaker to learn how to speak Navajo or Mandarin Chinese because those languages are um, farther away in terms of linguistics uh, in general. Uh, yeah, so does that make sense? I think that makes sense. Um, descriptive or structural linguistics is the study and analysis of the structure and content of particular languages. So what do those languages talk about? What does the, their vocabulary, um, what's their vocabulary set? What are the words that they have? I'm going to touch on that in a second here. That's super duper important what words are in given languages because if you look at a language and it's missing a word, particularly a pretty old word, then that means that maybe that group of people doesn't think that concept is super important, or they didn't have exposure to that sort of thing, or it speaks to the nature of the person who speaks that language. That'll make a little more sense in a second. And then sociolinguistics is a specialization within uh, and and that should, pro I th that should say anthropological linguistics there, not anthological linguistics. Anthropological linguistics uh, that focuses on uh, speech performance. Uh, so uh, specifically applying anthropological principles to uh, studies of linguistics, that's what sociolinguistics is. That also would apply to uh, sociology and also certain elements of um, social psychology as well. So this is the big thing I was addressing, uh, going back a second, 
in uh, terms of uh, structural linguistics and sociolinguistics. So peer wharf hypothesis, this is super duper important. This is one of the big ideas within anthropology and within sociology. It's like a big, the big mind blower ideas. Um, and just take this in, take, take a second to take this in. Language shapes thought. Language shapes thought. And that's probably contrary to how it is in your brain. The way we use language determines how we experience and perceive the world. And this can impact our perception of time. This can impact our perception of how big or small things are, how big or small we are whether we have a lot of something or a little of something is all a matter of language because language shapes what's happening in our brain and i see a, 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 and um, I, I see some of you being thoughtful and taking that in or at least pretending to that's great um just and if you have well what if questions right now hold them in your brain for a second because they might get answered so Sapir-Whorf hypothesis goes contrary to how we typically think of the thought process, right? This is a primo example within social sciences that our, quote, common sense about how the world works is actually not how it actually is. So the common perception is that first you think a thought, then you turn it into words, right? You think a thought, then you turn it into words. The reality is that you have words and then that dictates how you think, right? So, and I have a bunch of examples of this, but this is the first one that comes to mind. If you lived in the United States in the 1920s and you have never experienced hummus, right? Never experienced hummus because hummus was still pretty solidly in uh, the Middle East during that era and Africa and other places, but not in the United States. You could not get hungry for hummus, right? You could not really start craving hummus in the 1920s in the United States, right? Because you did not have the word, the concept of hummus, right? That's, that's a bit of that. And, and, and we'll, we'll work over some examples of this to give you more of this thought. But the, the, the short of Sapir-Whorf hypothesis is that you need words in your brain to be able to process the world. This says so much about humanity. It says that we are wired for language, right? So to be able to process the world around us, we need language. Examples and application of Sapir Whorf. If our language does not include the word orange, we may not see that color, right? And the degree to which that is true um, is a matter of debate. So, uh, and this is a matter of historic fact and linguistics. Uh, the word orange did not enter the English language until the colonial era. So until, and this is a picture of the uh, British countryside, I think outside of Wales. So until English speaking people started spreading over the world and colonizing and taking over and murdering people around the world, they didn't have that idea of orange. During that era, if they did see something that we would call orange, they typically called it either yellow, red, or red, yellow. They did not have a specific word for that color, right? That's pretty damn interesting. Additionally, if you go back to, um, I believe it is Greece, around 400 AD, prior to 400 AD, the Greeks did not have a word for blue, which is even kind of wilder surround, considering that most of Greece is surrounded by ocean. And that's, that's another harder abstractor idea to have. Like, what did they even call the ocean? Who knows? Anyway, um, 
And then we compare this orange issue with uh, the traditional Maasai language, which actually has a fair amount of orange in itself. Traditionally, the Maasai, who are a herding uh, nation, group of people in uh, Eastern Africa, they, th their only words for color were black, white, or red, right? Those were their words for color, black, white, or red. Their worlds were very heavily uh, involved, like black, white, and red were very important to them because their cows are typically black cows, right? And milk and blood from those cows made up a large, and still do make up a large portion of their diet. They actually routinely uh, bleed their cows and uh, consume uh, that blood as part of their uh, food because if you are reliant on herding cows, you can't actually be eating the cows all the time. Um, yeah, so those are were their three main colors. Now, given obviously the Maasai aren't stupid, right? In the modern world, they talk to other people. They have developed other words for other colors when talking outside of the outside of the Maasai language. But traditionally, they don't. They only talk black, white, red. And that's, it's super interesting when you look at Maasai artwork, uh, because obviously, check out her, her um, clothing here. There's some orange, there's some yellow in there, right? They would just say that yellow is a shade between maybe white and red, right? Like, just like we would say, oh, that's blue green or green blue, when if you don't have the word for tur turquoise, you'd call it that. Really super interesting how, your concept of colors. And that's actually a really interesting old, um, the, most societies aren't super aware of this, right? Uh, but uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, philosophy actually, it's a very old practice by Tibetan Buddhist scholars to debate how many colors there are. That's actually, and then just take, just say there are eight colors, there are 15 colors, there are 200 colors, and then like argue amongst themselves. Uh, that's actually part of the academics of the training of becoming a Tibetan Buddhist monk. Anyway, though, moving on. So, other applications of Sapir Whorf hypothesis. If you call someone your uncle that is not actually related to you by blood, right? And this is a relatively common practice. I'm the uncle of four kids that aren't related to me. You will treat them differently than if you call them your dad's friend, right? There's a different relationship there. And to test this, this is not a scientific practice, but to test this, I just put um, the words in to Google, I put in uncle. And I got this picture, and I think this was from a language website to show you the picture of the person, right? And then the word for uncle was underneath it, but this is the image for uncle, this is the image for my dad's friend, which is this guy showing his thumb that he got bruised by a hammer uh, because he hit it. And presumably this is the my dad's friend, right? Those are different dudes that you presume, right? My dad's friend can just be a wild kind of cornball and then uncle can be this guy. Now, let me say another thing and I did not put this in the presentation because really none of those pictures were suitable. Also, when I put in my dad's friend, I came up with a lot of erotica. Apparently, my dad's friend is a trigger word for sexy stuff for some people, right? Which is kind of interesting, too. It's all a matter of how we use words and how we construct that thing. Apparently, dad's friend is a, just one of those sexy words for some people. Oops, this is, okay, no, I messed up. Press the wrong button. Sorry about this. Okay, there's dad's friend. Okay, so other applications of Sapir Whorf hypothesis. And honestly, I can sit here all night and give you applications of Sapir Whorf hypothesis because that's just who I am. This is the last one. As we, as our society develops and continues and changes, we are 
perpetually introducing new words to our society. This is especially true when talking about the LGBT community, right? Because uh, if we compare to how we talked about uh, LGBT people between now and the early uh, 90s, for example, we wouldn't even be talking about trans people. If we were talking about trans people, we would be talking about them as they, they might be transgender. We'd probably talk about them as being transsexuals, which is what they were referred to as. And often, trans people just weren't talked about because people did not have the vocabulary for trans. Uh, Liberace here is a especially interesting uh, character in the history of, uh, I guess, the history of gayness. Uh, Liberace, if you're not familiar with him, was a famous uh, piano player and performer. Uh, he ended his career, his most sparkly element of his career, in Vegas in uh, the 60s and 70s. Uh, he was known for these elaborate performances with tons of flowers and candelabras and very fancy pianos. He actually has a really over-the-top museum in Vegas dedicated to him, if you ever make it out there. Uh, I would suggest that now. Now's not a time for Vegas. Uh, but, but Liberace died of AIDS in the 1980s during the gay plague era of AIDS, right? He, he died when, all the, uh, when a bunch of other gay people were dying of AIDS. And um, people did not, he, he, his co official cause of death was, um, I think like it, it was either something like extreme fasting or cancer, right? He, to the point, he hid, he buried that he had AIDS because he never came out as being gay, right? He, he was known to have so many boyfriends and all that, but he was never openly gay, even to us who today, you look at this dude, he's on fire flaming, right? But in that previous society, that wasn't obvious. And if you talk to women, now they, they would be older women now. And if you talk to women in the 60s and 70s and ask them about Liberace, at least like two out of 10 would say, oh, he's so attractive in a way that they, they thought that he was a potential partner for them right? There were a lot of ladies that really had the hots for Liberace during the 60s and 70s, mainly because they had no concept of gayness, right? It's really super interesting. To us today, we obviously, we, we, we see this happening with Liberace. Um, yeah, so if there are sexist, heterosexist, racist elements in our language, they will impact our thinking, right? If you don't have the words for things, you also won't be able to perceive them. So let's talk about some of the ways that humans use words. So uh, one way that humans, well, the main way that humans use words is communication, but communication is not the only, words are not the only way to communicate vocally. So sometimes when we're being lazy with our words, uh, we all talk about animals talking to us, right? Especially if we have relationships with animals, relationships with pets, we see the squirrels in our yards and we're looking at them, right? Uh, if you are on a college campus or you've spent any time on college campuses, they're squirrels, they just, they, they just are. They're socially acceptable rats, right? So we let them be, we let them run around, and they're there, right? Now, if you listen for it, and you might, you know, if you're on a college campus right now, when you're walking somewhere, you'll hear their little chitters and chatters, right? Those aren't birds, those are squirrels, and they are communicating to each other, but they are not using language, they're using a thing called a call system. Now, this isn't being derogatory to the squirrels. If squirrels had language, certainly we would find that very interesting as scientists, but they don't because those noises they are making, first of all, are very simple, right? They're very, very simple. They communicate a simple primal um, message such as danger or, hey, there's food, or, hey, 
want to have sex, right? These are things that animals communicate, right? And also, if you think about it, us humans communicate these things too without really thinking about it too, right? Uh, particularly things like danger, right? If you are frightened by something, uh, me particularly, uh, if I get spooked by something, I yell really loud, right? And you don't think about doing that, how you respond to danger. Respond to danger. But if people hear you yelling it, even how you yell, people know, hey, there's danger over there. So they either run away or run toward, right? That is a type of call system similar to how uh, animals do it. Um, another thing specifically that humans do that is uh, thought to be related to call systems, like pre-linguistic call systems, is laughter. Uh, laughter is a uh, kind of social response that other social animals do. And some animals do laugh like humans do, particularly primates. Uh, and it is not about showing your approval necessarily that you think it's something is funny, but the sound is tied with bonding mechanisms of other uh, animals of your type, other humans, right? So you laugh and then if someone laughs at your jokes or laughs at what you're laughing at you think they're you know pretty kind of cool or great or someone to hang out with right uh that's the the call system nature of laughter it's again it's all these things are super interesting in a fun nerdy sort of way now let's talk specifically about human language and what makes human language different than those weird titters and uh, sounds that squirrels make. Um, human language tends toward complexity. So human language is markedly much more elaborately complex than the ways other animals uh, communicate with each other. Um, I always, I, I always uh, in these presentations about animal language and animal communication, say, say things like, as far as we know, because uh, in the last couple of decades, we actually have found um, that animal communication with each other is actually much more complex than we perceive. Uh, for example, uh, there have been in the call signs Again, what is call sign, what is language is a matter of debate, but certain bird, certain species of birds do actually have regional dialects, right? Which is super duper interesting. Um, but the short of all of this is that, uh, and outside this dumb rambling I just started doing, uh, human language, human communication is super duper complex. Universal grammar. So, all human languages tend to have this base universal grammar, right? They all have these parts. We just tend to use these parts in different ways, in di different variations. In all languages that I'm aware of, right? Languages have verbs, right? So they have those action words. Languages have nouns, they have our things, right? Languages have adverbs, they have adjectives, right? And those are, those are at the core of universal grammar, right? Is those concepts of parts of speech. And there are many other elements of universal grammar that make things human language and make us able to study human language, but that's where we're gonna, that, that's where I'll stop boring you with that. And those, principles underlie our language. And then universal grammar ties in with syntax. And syntax is pretty damn interesting. Syntax regarding, re relating to language is the part of grammar that has to do with the arrangements of, wor arrangements of words to form phrases and sentences, right? So in syntax, and the reason we have a picture of a human trying to communicate with a chimpanzee is syntax is the thing that messes up primates when communicating with humans, right? Uh, and it, it, it's a really interesting dividing line, right? So there have been many primates, uh, be it a chimp, 
be it a gorilla, be it an orangutan, that we've been able to teach some elements of words and language, but they never quite, especially, they never, even the really super famous gorillas like Coco the gorilla, those ones that really got it, they never got syntax. They, they would say something like, uh, I love funny man, right? But they wouldn't get, uh, so for example, I'm just thinking about particular, Coco the gorilla had a relationship actually with Robin Williams, right? Uh, Robin Williams uh, died tragically a couple years ago. Uh, he uh, tied in with depression and suicide. And when Coco was told about that, and even to this, actually Coco's dead now too, whatever. But if Coco were still alive, Coco would say, I love funny man. Coco would not say, I loved funny man, right? Or she would even, she could, and it was just a matter of randomness. Sometimes she would say something like, funny man loved I, loved funny man I. She wouldn't get how the words were supposed to go together, right? In a way that us humans get in terms of communication. She didn't get that interweaving of words together. And that's, that's all syntax. And then core vocabulary is another common uh, human, human uh, thing, right? There are certain words that are in all languages, right? So uh, home is in most human, not all, but most human languages. Uh, food, words for food, uh, basic, Clothing is in there, right? There are these commonalities that are uh, almost entirely universal. And there are interestingly uh, certain words that are super at the core too. Um, almost, here's an example, almost all words for mother start with a mm sound. Um, th there are variations in languages, but they almost all have start with a letter M sound. Um, and it's, it's interesting and also so never so slightly derogatory toward fathers. Uh, there is less variation. Uh, there's more variation in uh, the father sounds. Uh, they often have a D but not always have a D, sometimes they have a B, B, a letter B sound, um, and you always find yourself doing that when talking about uh, linguistics. Anyway, that's, that's beside the point. Um, yeah. Any questions on that stuff right there? No? No, this is, it's all super interesting stuff. It's, it's a little dry, it's on the super nerdy side, but it is, it is very interesting. Gender. And uh, this kind of, if you have a question here, please let me know because uh, this is uh, what we're going to be talking about in our um, essay prompt for this week. Um, gender in terms of linguistics, right? Uh, we're not talking about um, our personal gender identities here. We're not talking about anything having to do with sexuality or that sort of thing. We're talking about here how gender works in language. But certainly that applies to sexuality and all that, but we're talking about how it works in the basics of how language operates. Gender classes usually govern agreement between nouns, pronouns, and adjectives. Now the thing is, if you only speak English and you don't have exposure to other languages, you may be almost entirely unaware of this, right? Because in the English language, the only words that really apply so much in terms of gender and the mechanics of the language are sometimes pronouns. And even that we've started to go a little bit more neutral in terms of pronouns in our modern English language. Now, it will be very interesting in the following decades as we, as a humanity, become more accepting in linguistics and how we talk about people and talk about gender, how these other languages shift. Uh, for example, in Spanish, 
uh, and in Spanish, French, Russian, whole bunch of languages, especially Indo-European languages, different words have different gender. So, uh, in, and I do not speak very much Spanish at all, so please excuse me. Uh, masculine words, el amor, uh, is this my love? Is that what that means? Does anyone speak Spanish? Does that mean my love? Okay, my love, so the person I love who is masculine, right? El perro, dog, the map, the, the bus, right? The bus, bus doesn't have a penis, right? Uh, the map doesn't have a penis. These are ra randomnesses in the language itself. And most of these words, uh, la cama, right? Uh, the bed isn't have a, having a baby, right? Uh, all of these things, the television isn't inherently female, right? All of their, their randomalities, right, in the language itself. And most of those words, what is male, what is female in those languages, they tend to be random. And then when, whenever I say tend to be, there's always a well except when, right? Um, there are definitely certain languages that are definitely structurally more male dominated, right? And there are definitely those that are more uh, uh, gender neutral, right? Take this part of your brain that was brewing over superior wharf hypothesis then there. And what does that say about not about the people, but about the ways that you can think about gender if you speak those languages, right? Does, does, and this is such a philosophical thing, and this is the, the, the crux of what you're writing about this week. If you speak a language that requires you to identify things in the household as being female, are you more primed to think that females on a subconscious level should do more housework than males, right? What does your language do to you in that regard? And then also, how do you break that? How, how, do, you, how do you fix that in going into the future, right? It's a, it's a really super interesting uh, concept there. And that's, that's what you're gonna write about this week. So get back over here. Uh, code switching. Oh, wait, why did it? Ah, uh, well, code switching is in this part. It doesn't necessarily belong in this part, but it's fine. Uh, code switching is the ability of individuals who speak either multiple languages or multiple dialects to move seamlessly between those languages or dialects. Um, and if you've only ever lived in one spot, if you, and, and going on vacation does a little bit of this, but you really have to be away from the place where you grew up and the community you grew up. You may never have experienced this, but if you are a person who sometimes interacts with people outside of your core community, maybe you do do this. Um, switching between sets of vocabulary, switching in between whether you say you all, y'all, you guys, right? And when do you do that? When do you not do that? I um, grew up outside of Pittsburgh. And when I go back to Pittsburgh, I do sometimes subconsciously switch back into Pittsburgh ways of doing things. No, I consciously cannot. Some people can. I can't just fall back in to Pittsburghese, which is really its own kind of thing. Uh, so for example, in Pittsburgh, if something is slippery, we uh, might say it's slippy. That's a Pittsburghism saying like, like uh, the, the streets, watch out, it's slippy out there, would mean it's icy. Um, jaggers are thorns. Uh, a real common Pittsburghism is to call a sandwich a sandwich. Uh, we call Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. Um, all the sorts of things. Uh, things you might not necessarily know or even gum band, rubber band, that's a whole thing. Anyway, those are certain linguistic elements that we switch back into. Now, 
in when we talk about uh, you can talk about racial politics, racial race relations too in this regard. Uh, it is really common for uh, black people who speak what is called AAVE or African American vernacular English to code switch relatively quickly because um, they have been, uh, maybe this is how their family speaks when they're home, but you go to school, maybe you're encouraged to speak differently uh, or that sort of thing. That, that's, a, that's a common thing. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about AAVE in uh, the next couple slides because that specifically has to do with the politics of a specific dialect. And that really is a matter of, wow, race is super part of uh, who we are um, in, in a way that a lot of we just don't think about really unless we have experience with that sort of thing. Exact same, the exact, oh my God, some of these things just really hit home for me. What you've never talked about unthawing your frozen thing? Anyway, uh, dialects. So, Languages that are widespread typically have multiple dialects, right? So some languages are super, super duper local, right? There are certain languages that are only spoken by people that live in, I'm thinking about one specifically, in a specific valley in Spain, right? It's a very rare uh, whistling language I'm talking about, this very specific rare language where they communicate by whistling. It's almost entirely extinct now, but that's a super local language. There isn't dialects or regionalism in that language because it didn't go anywhere, right? But other languages, they spread out, they get different dialects. Um, and in the United States, uh, we have, and I don't have the key for this one right here, but here is, and obviously this is Canada, but Canada is one dialect region. Uh, most people in Canada speak one kind of Canadian English almost, except for Newfoundland. Newfoundland and part of Maine, they have this kind of different dialect. And then uh, here, the deep orange down here is the South, but here in the Ar Arkansas region, they speak another dialect. And then in the deep south in the Texas area, they speak that sort of thing. Uh, people out west have this sort of thing. Note this number seven is my native dialect, the Western Pennsylvanian dialect. But note that Philadelphia and other parts of this, so my, I have a dear family who are in Eastern Pennsylvania, and when they really do spark, start getting homey, if you will, uh, they become almost incomprehensible to me. I can't understand a damn word they're saying. Uh, and there's just all these things, these, these weird little regionalisms that we have. And here we have a uh, more local one to us, right? Uh, we here in Ohio do tend to speak a little bit differently than say people in, in central Ohio than people in Cleveland do. And the closer you get, say, uh, down to Cincinnati, the more likely people might start sounding more Southern. That's because that's the, their regional dialect. And uh, it should be pointed out that these are not, um, these aren't hard borders, right? There's nothing official or legal here, right? Uh, your Midlander, could be as far down into Tennessee and all that sort of thing. It's just kind of a uh, re these regional concepts, real super interesting. They're called speech communities. Um, the way we speak English in like, I guess, acceptable official ways, I suppose what I'm speaking now, this is standard spoken American English. That's what that's officially called standard spoken American English. Um, th that would be, I guess, the English that your English teachers teach you, or that what you see on TV when someone without an accent is speaking, that's standard spoken American English. And then these, air these regions here, those would be uh, speech communities. Now, dialects are often tied with region, but not only tied to regions, right? So here we have uh, the UK. The UK has many more 
uh, dialects than, than the United States has, very interestingly. Um, a big part of that is that people have been in the UK for about a thousand years longer than they've been in the United States. So their, uh, their uh, regionalisms have had much more time to get more embedded and more distinct, right? Um, but also in British accents, they have more pronounced class accents to them, right? So uh, the Cockney accent and the posh accent in particular, po the posh accent is, uh, it tends to focus in London, but is all over uh, the UK. It's people who are, are fancier, right? It's, it's people who are of upper class. It's more closely tied to what's called the Queen's English. The Queen's English is this, high version of English accent that is considered most acceptable. Well, why is it considered the most acceptable? It's because it originated with the aristocracy, right? And multiple um, European languages have what's called the high or the royal version of those languages. You see it in Germany. I think there's a touch of that in Russia. Places that had very old uh, aristocratic traditions, they tend to have that, the rich people version of the language. That's, and part of that is, and embedded in the English language, why Americans tend to think people with British accents, they're so fancy. It's because it's kind of like a ancestral remembrance of that, no matter who the English person actually is. Um, it's really pretty interesting that way. Anything else, other points I wanted to make here? Yeah, and uh, it goes the other way too. The Cockney accent is more of a language of poor people. Um, and there's this really super interesting element of Cockney accent known as Cockney rhyming slang where Cockney rhyming slang was used specifically by criminals in big cities to talk to each other so that they could talk and the cops wouldn't understand them. Um, in like, uh, if you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, like a thieves can't kind of thing, that's totally a thing that really existed, uh, you know, again. Cool, anyway. Dialects may also be tied with race or ethnicity. Um, which is uh, pretty interesting. And before we really get into this, it should be noted that because of the racism embedded in our society, conversations surrounding dialects have often become intensely racist, actually, because you get people expressing opinions that don't know what the hell they're talking about, right? That's the best time for racism to come out is people not actually knowing what they're talking about. Um, and uh, so obviously some good intending conversations have happened that have also over time become or been racist or whatever. Uh, a lot of mistakes have been made. And, and there are terms that maybe were used in the 70s or 80s that are not acceptable today. Uh, if you go back to films of uh, civil rights activists in the uh, 60s and 70s, things like MLK and other people, uh, you hear them using uh, the word Negro, where we would definitely use either African American or Black, right? Negro is not an acceptable word in these conversations now today, nor should it be, right? But it shifted. You see a similar thing in conversations surrounding uh, American Indians around the term Indian, then shifted over to Native American in the 90s or so. And if you're not familiar with these communities, actually the preferred nomenclature for the people that had previously been called Native American is American Indian. Uh, and part of that is what the group themselves want to be called. Uh, many Native peoples living in North America, they far prefer to be called American Indians. That's the, the words they use amongst themselves and the words they prefer. Now, there definitely is variations among tribal communities over what word they prefer. The, in general, though, with that, American Indian is the preferred nomenclature there. So, uh, still talking about this, and now specifically talking about African American vernacular English, also known as AAVE. AAVE is a form of English spoken by many African Americans, particularly of rural or 
urban working class backgrounds. And this, this of working class or rural, of, of working people, right? Of people who are less likely to be educated. That doesn't mean stupid, it's just lower levels of education. Because through the educational process, we tend to get yelled at by English teachers to stop talking like that, right? When I was in fourth grade, I remember being yelled at by uh, school teachers to not say certain things that everyone around us said that was part of our uh, Pittsburghese language, right? A similar phenomena uh, occurs uh, surrounding AAVE dialects. Now, I, I don't do this very much at all, but I found a PowerPoint presentation that uh, I found this online uh, that was way better than the slide that I actually had. Um, and it was just, it was way better than mine. So I just thought it was uh, best to go over. So at, we'll just go through this someone else's slide. Uh, this is not my own work. Uh, as with all spoken language, AAVE is extremely regular, rule governed and systematic, right? So the ways that the this particular dialect work, there are definitely rules to it, right? So it doesn't regard a certain degeneration, which is what racist arguments talked about it. At the heart of AAVE is phonology and grammar, so it's just as much a dialect like other dialects. AAVE does have some distinctive lexical terms, such as what people know from rap and hip hop and other popular black culture and slang. Young people's vocabulary, which is almost by definition, by almost by definition subjects to rapid change, which may in many cases cross over or diffuses from other ethnic groups. So what does that mean? It means the slang changes and melds and goes uh, within uh, AAVE specifically. And we see this in other regional dialects too. Now this, this last bullet is really what struck me. Non-specialist attitudes, this is really important. Non-specialist attitudes toward AAVE can be negative, especially amongst African Americans, as it both deviates from the standard and its uses is interpreted at best as a sign of ignorance or laziness. What does that mean? It means that um, there are a lot of people that really want the best for their community that say, why are you talking like that? You make us all look stupid, right? And unless they have an understanding of dialects, specifically of linguistics, right? They might think that a given person speaking the given dialect is stupid. And that's, that's built into our wiring as humans, right? We think that the way that our teachers speak to us is inherently the superior way of speaking the language, right? The reality of the matter is there is no superior way of, as long as you're following the grammar and putting it together and you, you know, there's no superior way of speaking. I mean, which is go tell that to a high, high school English teacher, but like we're communicating to every other human being successfully, right? And that's kind of the point, right? Now, conversations around AAVE got particularly stupid in the 1990s, which is what this slide is about. So AAVE is also known as Ebonics, um, which we don't use that term to refer to it anymore because the word Ebonics got a weird negative connotation in the 1990s through particularly stupid, well-intending people, right? I'm not saying those people are stupid, it's like they did stupid things. Anyway, the term Ebonics fell out of favor in the 90s because it was, it, of the derisive political conversations about it. Um, I'm gonna read through this and then work through uh, these illustrations because they ve are very, very telling. Uh, much of the controversy stems from poorly thought out proposals in the San Bernardino County, which is a California school district. Uh, so these, these, and keep in mind, always remember this, just because you're on school board doesn't mean you know anything about education, right? Just because you're an elected official doesn't necessarily mean you understand linguistics. Well, there were people on the San Bernardino school board that were well intending that, that proposed that what they were calling Ebonics 
be taught in schools because it was significantly different from standard American English, right? Which, in reality, it is a dialect, right? It's a dialect. Should we then be teaching Southeastern grammar in Georgian schools? Maybe, right? Should we then be teaching North Dakotan grammar in, uh, in, those, in the, those regions, right? Maybe. Right, I don't know. Should should our should our linguistics be super regional? That was the point. This turned into a really, but because it related to black people, right, and because our society is inherently racist, it got really ugly and really racist super fast, right? To fit both of these on the same slide, I actually had to cut out um, cut out the bottom of this, which is kind of unfortunate, but. We really see this in these two illustrations. You just look, if you look at this image right here, it says, I be yo teacher for foe today, which really isn't even how AAVE works. But, but we look at this guy, his shirt is untucked, his ties, he has stink lines. He has literal stink lines right here. That is some racist ass shit happening in this, in this picture right here, right? That's unacceptable, right? And this was in newspapers. And then we have another picture down here saying, we be learning the kids good yo fascists. It's, it's, that's not any, how anyone speaks, right? But they're implying that, well, this is what we're going to do to teach children. And it's obviously inferior. And what is really also, I need to pull one second, I need to adjust this. I need to really show you this hideous picture because it's so damn insulting. Look at this, look. Check out all the white kids he's teaching, right? He's not even teaching black kids. These are white children, right? So it's implying that these lazy, horrible black people are going to be come in, coming in to your white schools to corrupt them, right? That's what's happening in these arguments, right? Now, these guys in the San Bernardino, California school district, they probably were really trying to help or black kids. That's probably what they were trying to do, right, within that school and within that community. And maybe they would have come up with some interesting, innovative solutions if it just would have stuck with that school. But this stuff, this, this conversation and this argument spread like wildfire across the country in ways that like there were really stupid and really dumb, um, uh, like, late night jokes on this stuff too. So like just in, in ways that like really made no sense. It got completely out of control. Anyway though, any questions on that? On anything in there? Comments, whatever? Um, I have a question. Sure. Okay, I might be missing something I don't actually know. Um, so if they thought that that was like an inferior way of speaking, why did they push to teach it in schools? So great, that's a really good question. So the guys, the, the guys, the people in the school district, I don't know what their sex was. Um, the people in the school district did not think it was inferior, right? They were making an argument that this is a equal mode of speaking and, but they were making the kind of equally racist argument that black people are speaking a different language from white people, which is also insulting, right? It's really along the night, very, and my next slide talks about th this too, the very well-intending white people of the 1990s trying to make things work, but not actually knowing what they're talking about. Does that make sense? Yeah, so they were trying to help actually. In the school district, they were trying to help. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. That's a good question. Uh, anything else here? Um, I have a question and it's from like three slides ago. Uh, everything just moves so fast. Um, but about 
the regions in America with uh, the different dialects, I remember learning in high school that there was like a portion in Toledo where there's apparently like no accent or something. I learned that in like my CCP English class and I still have no idea what that means or like how you would lack an accent. Like would that be its own dialect or whatever? Well, I'm not entirely, I've never quite heard that before, uh, but um, it's an interesting proposition. I'm not sure. I can't confirm or deny that. Um, but that's a really inter interesting point there too, uh, Corey. Um, what it comes down to is most, we, we all do have accents is a thing, thing about it. And we often don't even, uh, this, this, this goes back to my person, personal experiences too. I obviously, you, you guys have listened to me talk for hours and hours. I have some weird vocal tics. I go high pitched in some moments, but like I do those things, right? And I think of them when I'm not around the people I grew up with as being my weird vocal expressions. But when I'm around my family, they do the same damn weird things, right? Like it just has to do with like the weird valleys and hollers that my people came up in. And then I learned to, I learned to speak and I'm sure I'm giving some of that weirdness to my kids. Um, yeah. What, what else? Oh, my, my grandmother. Um, she was, she grew up in Eastern Pennsylvania, right? Everyone I knew grew up in Western Pennsylvania. I thought that forever that my gra that was just how Gramps Gramps Gram spoke, right? And then it wasn't until I went back to Eastern PA, it's like, oh, oh, that's that accent. My Gram doesn't speak unique. Everyone over here speaks like Gram, right? That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, the closest thing, the Toledo thing, that might be a touch dated. Uh, now, if we look at standard vernacular English, American English, I would, if I were to put forth a hypothesis, I would say that you would be most likely to find those accentless regions in either um, some parts of New York City or more likely in Los Angeles because they broadcast the most, right? They make the most media, right? So we, what we think of as normal, unaccented English is basically what we see on TV most, is what I would, yeah. Cool, anything else here? Oh yeah. I also have a question. So the AAVE, did they have like only different dialects or was it more of, they also had different like phonology? Uh, it is mostly qualified as a dialect yes uh yeah mostly qualifies as a uh, as a dialect there are no that's a, that's a really interesting different phonology i suppose every dialect has di has different phonology actually right that's a great question right so each dialect each language has slightly different phonology yeah that's a that's a good applied question good job Anything else? Cool. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Uh, and let me turn my slideshow back on while I'm here. God, I hate that. I, this is just the most racist thing. Uh, and, you know, I don't really shy away from showing racist things. You just point out how ugly and racist it is. Okay, I go. Okay. So as I pointed out, another reason why we don't talk about Ebonics anymore and talk about AAVE is because these conversations we had in the 90s trying to fix race were so ugly and clumsy. But I'll tell you, I was in high school during this era. Uh, we thought we, you know, we had this whole race problem fixed, right? Because every generation since the 60s thought they had the whole race problem fixed. Um, these are very similar to I don't see race arguments, right? Uh, surrounding, well, and that's both, those are mostly generated by privileged white people saying, well, I don't see race. I just treat everyone equally. 
Well, if you do that then, then you are then ignoring what makes people unique and you're also ignoring their problems they experience by people like you who don't see race and don't issue problems. Uh, here, this is actually a really good illustration. I'll talk about this in a second. Uh, here we have from the, um, I'm still sharing my PowerPoint, right guys? Yeah, okay. Uh, here we have what were known as the United Colors of Benetton ads. Uh, the United Colors of Benetton were infamous in the 90s for being really uh, heavy handed in terms of trying to make these outrageous political statements, right? So here we have a uh, black woman and a white woman holding a baby in a blanket. Wow, what a bold statement that means nothing. What exactly is happening here? Uh, I guess halfway between black people and white people is Asian people. Like, that's a pretty screwed up statement there too, right? It's, 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 and in so many of, especially United Color of Benetton ads, but also a lot of these efforts in the 90s to not be racist or fix racism, they actually get more deeply spiralingly racist, right? It, it really gets, and you can go on a really weird deep dive of uh, Google searches with United Colors of Benetton, and those ads are just like so screwed up. Uh, similarly, uh, does any, show of hands, does anyone remember the Burger King Kids Club? Anyone way before your time? Okay, Burger King. They had this thing called the Burger King Kids Club. Uh, it was kind of their answer to Ronald McDonald. Every fast food place needs their cartoons. And they had the kids club. And it was so ham-fisted as wheels. You know wheels, the kid in the wheelchair. Well, that was his nickname was wheels. Um, and then Lingo was the Asian kid because I guess he speaks multiple languages or whatever. Uh, the black character isn't as overwhelmingly uh, racist. He was apparently the one that was real good at sports, of course. Um, and then it's mostly uh, white people. Um, white by default, of course. Uh, really, really over the tops attempts at diversity, real clumsy uh, attempts at diversity. Um, in ways that just would, would not fly today. I guess the point of this whole slide is we've come a long way, kind of. Um, but then here is uh, the equality versus equity um, points that are made. And this is a more modern kind of our, our conversation we have. Uh, that really what was pushed in the 90s was, and early 2000s, um, were, well, we need to make everyone equal. Well, if you make everyone equal, you still have this one person here that can't necessarily see up over the fence, right? And we have this one person that's way higher than the fence and doesn't help them out. Well, conversations of equity and human equity uh, are, uh, they just, they make more sense, right? They, they make more sense in getting people what they need. Uh, then you can also have the conversation, well, what are these people doing out here when they could be over there in those stands getting a better look right there? Well, that's, that's another thing altogether. Next slide. Um, okay, here's some more uh, vocab stuff uh, relating to uh, dialects, getting back from uh, my fun tangent on AAVE and those conversations. Uh, there are also different types of dialects, right? So these are, um, yeah, anyway, I thought I made an error there. I had to look at it for a second. No, okay, there's other types of dialects. One type of dialect is called Creole. Creole is a first language that is composed of elements of two or different languages. Right? So Creole is right on the edge of being a dialect or being a language, right? It's, it's in that gray area there. Um, 
Now, this term first language, if you have notes you're taking at home, you might want to underline first language there, because here's the definition of first language. A first language is one that is learned by speaking it in the home, right? Uh, most often when, in linguistics, when we talk about first languages, uh, they are typically non-dominant languages, right? So they're spoken by uh, usually minority groups without the dominant position in society. For example, um, if, you, if your first language, if you live in the United States, your first language is English, that's not really notable. Right? That's not really something to really talk about or study. It's just what it is, right? If your first language is, say, uh, Pennsylvania Dutch, then that is something you have to deal with in growing up, right? Which makes makes it more of a worth studying thing. Or it could be or Spanish or or Somali or whatever, right? That would be your first language. Um, and then Creole is a type of first language. It's, it's that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Did I confuse anyone there? We got it. Good. Okay. Now, Creole languages, because there are many types of Creole, right? Creole languages are, um, one second. Anyway, sorry. Creole languages are very rarely official languages. An official language is a language that has determined to be legally acceptable for the purposes of doing business. There are no, there is no legal language in the United States. That's something that we don't do in the United States for a variety of reasons. So it is legal to do government business in any language in the United States. Now, that, that's a decision we've made as a society. Um, you could make an argument that, well, that's good in terms of inclusiveness because, because English is not our official language, then we can be more inclusive people. Uh, we can often offer translators all that. Or you could make an argument that if English and Spanish were both official languages in the United States, then we would be better able to help this massive majority of the population in our, in our society that speaks Spanish fluently, better able to go through their lives. For example, in Canada, uh, there is a large uh, portion of Quebecois who speak primarily French. So through all of Canada, everything must be in both English and French. Um, but uh, a, a real pretty powerful uh, application of this is a, where we would most likely see uh, this, uh, our lack of official language in English is uh, at the pharmacy. At most pharmacies, you will see a, um, a table of, uh, that says, I can't read it right here. I know this basically says, uh, point to your language and we will be able to uh, provide a translator to. Uh, that's a failing of my projector. Anyway, though, that, that's really pretty common in some places. Uh, you would also see the sign in many government offices uh, in the most common languages of this region or Sometimes it's who they have access, access to translators of. I have seen uh, Deutsch on these lists too, that Pennsylvania Dutch language, I've seen that on these lists too. Um, now, with that said though, so in the United States, you have to, you have a right to a translator that will speak your language fluently. You do have a right to that. That is actually something, if you're going to go vote, if you're going to go do business in a government office, you have the right to that. However, there is a failing in that those translators are not always available, right? There is definitely a major failing there in our society. There are often translators, but a real common problem among uh, minority speaking populations is, is that lack of translators, right? 
Um, and that's uh, a the, the biggest issue with that in uh, central Ohio and the city of Columbus is a lack of Somali speaking uh, translators for older Somali people that aren't, they may speak some English, but they're not really fluent in English. And if you're going to go do your taxes, you have to be super fluent in English. And that's a major problem. So therefore, we have little kids trying to help their parents go to the tax office and talk about taxes and it's completely busted, right? That's a big issue. It's a huge issue. And arguments of, well, you live in America, you better speak English. I just, I don't, those are, aren't acceptable in any way because my, my people, right? We were writing, we were doing all of our correspondence in German up until about the early 1900s. And we were here for about 200 years, right? So like, when I hear my family members make those kind of arguments, it's like, oh, you got to be kidding me. But his great great grandpa wrote his will all in German, and you don't got an excuse. Anyway, that's just my theology, man. Anyway, boop, boop. get this thing working. One second. I might have a freeze. There we are. Okay. So I was talking about Creole again before I got off into this weird screed. A uh, Creole, when you spell it with a capital C, is actually a specific type of Creole dialect slash language. That was a fun sentence. Anyway, the Creole language uh, is found most predominantly in Louisiana and other parts of the South, right? So even historically, when this whole chunk was all Louisiana, in this Louisiana zone, the most commonly spoken uh, Creole language was Creole, right? Uh, it's mo most correctly known as Bourbonnaise Creole, uh, or they'd probably say Bourbonnaise, anyway, uh, Bourbonnaise Creole. Uh, this dialect first developed among French fur traders in the Louisiana territory. So what they were doing was they spoke French, but in order to get by, they kind of combined French with English, and uh, then by speaking some French words and some English words, they were able to communicate with uh, English speakers, and they were able to communicate with uh, American Indian tribes that knew some English words and some French words too. Uh, so Creoles often develop out of being forced to be um, cultural in a very practical sort of way. Um, other French Creoles, and this is interesting, can be found in other parts of the world that were impacted by French colonialism. There are also English Creoles. There are German Creoles too. Um, and that'll be a little, where did that come from? Well, that came from pidgin languages. Uh, pidgin is a language of cont contact and trade composed of features of the original language of two or more societies. So where pidgin languages come from is they are actually official mishmashes of languages that occur in certain regions of the world. Now, which mishmash is occurring is what is needed by those people, right? So uh, in Canada, uh, the, the uh, pidgin that was spoken there was a combination of English and native tribe languages, right? They call their uh, uh, indigenous people First Nations people in Canada, by the way. They're, they're not called American Indians in Canada. Um, you see in a good portion of Africa, the pidgin languages were combinations of French and those uh, native languages. But in the other half of Africa, the pidgins were made up of um, English and the native language. But then we have this Belgian region here where that was occurring. Now, the pidgin that was spoken in uh, Canada was absolutely different. It was British pidgin, but it was different than the British pigeon that was spoken in uh, Australia, which was also different than the pigeon that was spoken in India too, right? They, they were languages of trade there. Um, any questions there?
One point here that's super interesting that's made, oh, I didn't make it here. Uh, the pidgin languages then often lead or led because this is very much a phenomenon that occurred in that colonial era of world history, right? When all these, and there's a reason why you don't see any of these in the European region here, and you see it in these areas that were colonized, right? It's because these were a, we a tool, a weapon, if, it, if you will, uh, used by Europeans to basically um, be able to communicate in these areas. You could also argue destabilize these areas. Um, but if people speak pidgin in an area long enough, which is very much a business language, the pidgin will become a Creole, right? So in, go back, in Louisiana and the Louisiana Purchase area, they first were speaking a French pigeon of the local area. And then eventually enough people spoke that, that it became a natively spoken Creole. Does that make sense? Yeah. Interesting stuff. And you can see, man, you can see if, be super careful with this stuff because um, you can see how this stuff gets super racist super fast. Like this is real sensitive, careful stuff here. Um, yeah, anyway, until, until you get that A on the quiz, uh, just don't bring this up with your parents. <laughs> okay, so uh, this uh, week's culture of the week is Russia. Um, because as I mentioned, uh, I speak a little bit of Russian uh, very badly. And um, I actually know a whole lot about Russian history. Um, one of the things that my, uh, Otterbein's a liberal arts school, right? If I remember correctly, yeah. One of the things that I got from my liberal arts education at Westminster uh, was, um, was, I know way too much about Russian. I took a medieval Russian history class. I took a modern Russian history class. I speak a little bit of Russian and it doesn't apply to anything I do in my life, but I am a more full individual because I know a shit ton about Russia. So here we go. And now I'm applying my liberal arts education. So the official name of Russia is the Russian Federation. Uh, Russia has both a flag of three colors right here. They also have a crest. Uh, many European uh, nations do have standards like this in addition to their flags. It's just an extra fancy little bit. Uh, the capital of Russia is Moscow and their government type is semi-presidential federation, uh, which doesn't mean so much more and make them so much different than other European parliamentary societies, uh, but it, it's, you know, how they're defined. So, religion is interesting in Russia. Uh, due to the ideology of the Soviet era, era, atheism is very common, but it's very hard to confirm exactly what, um, exactly what it, uh, what their religion, what, what people are. People just don't talk about it, right? In the United States, we talk about religion all the freaking time, right? In uh, Russia, they, they are super cagey about it. And a big part of that is because you could get in real trouble in Russia during the Soviet era for talking about religion. You could get in prison. You could set, be sent to Siberia, right? Uh, so that, that was a big thing. Uh, according to probably one of the more reliable sources in this regard, uh, Russian Orthodox Christians make up anywhere from 15 to 20% of the population of Russia. Uh, other Christians uh, make up about 2%. Uh, Muslims in Russia make up 10 to 15%. Uh, so if we're talking non atheist religion people, because you can make an interesting conversation, is atheism a religion, is it not a religion, whatever. Well, non-atheists anyway, after that, the second largest uh, 
religious population in Russia is Muslims. And uh, take note of that because it does come in, it, it, it does come up when you talk about population density uh, and where population density is. It makes a whole lot of sense. We don't typically think of Russia as being a Muslim place. Russia has seven time zones, right? The United States, uh, mainland United States anyway, we have four time zones. If you extend it out into Hawaii, we have six time zones, but really we have four time zones. Um, Russia spans over 6.6 .6 million square miles. Compare that to the United States, we are 3.7 million square miles, right? So Russia is a whole, whole lot bigger than we are, right? Uh, in terms of space, right? If you look at this map of the world, this big red blob up here, that's all Russia. Uh, their population though is 144.5 million people. Our population is 328 million people, right? So there are almost twice as many people in the United States than there are in Russia. Additionally then, their population density is 23 people per square mile, while our population density is 92 pe people per square mile. That means there is a whole lot more people per mile. Or, there's a lot more Americans closer together, right, is what that means. Now, understanding that on a different level, we look at population density here. These aren't perfectly comparable maps, but they're pretty good. Uh, the darker red uh, here is basically where people are, right? And then you look at Russia, everything past the Ural Mountains are right here, by the way. Ev almost everything past this mountain range is empty as hell, right? That's what that's what Russian look Russia looks like. A uh, good portion of Russia is super duper empty. Now remember that bit I said about Islam. Look at this here. After this main air population area, we have a heavy population down here, down by the Black Sea, and other smaller population areas more adjacent to uh, basically uh, the Muslim world. So that's where that secondary um, religion thing comes from. Uh, another reason we have a high population area down here in the Black Sea is because this is the nice part of Russia, right? Uh, same reason why we have high population density in California is because California is really nice, right? Uh, yeah, so there's that sort of thing. So Russia has an intensely old history. Uh, Prince Rorik of Dorstad was the first uh, leader of the Rus people. Uh, Russia is so old that it was first called Rus and then uh, Russia. Uh, Russia is the Russian word for Russia. It's Russia. Um, uh, Prince Rorik and his people were very similar to pre-Christian Norse Vikings. Uh, the best way to understand uh, medieval slash ancient Russian society is to understand them as Vikings who stayed still, right? That's basically who the ancient Russians were. Uh, the Rus would eventually uh, split into Ukrainians and Russians. Culturally, Ukraine and Russia are pretty similar. Um, even though they, 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 they disagree, uh, they're pretty similar. Uh, Ukrainian language is actually markedly different than Russian, it is its own thing, but linguistically, uh, they're very, very similar. So uh, someone can speak Ukrainian and speak to someone who's speaking Russian and they can basically understand each other. Uh, relating to Rorik, Rorik's uh, life details are debated among historians uh, because, you know, uh, he was, I believe it was, let me look here. Oops, I did it again. One second, sorry. Uh, Rorik was in 828, right? Like a um, thousand years ago. Did I cut out? Am I still here, guys? Okay, all you paused all at once. So, okay. Still here. So, the kingdom of uh, the kingdom slash empire of Russia 
uh, span from 862 AD to 1919 AD, right? It was almost, a, it was more than a thousand years of being this vast kingdom. Uh, they had, uh, the kingdom itself had three, uh, three eras. The Grand Prince era spanned from 882 AD to 1547 AD, the Tsar region. Uh, so they went from being princes to being kings uh, from 1547 to 1721. During this era, um, this king era, the czars acted more as kings do, so they had less power. And then during the emperor era, the czars uh, from 1721 to 1917, where they acted more like uh, the Queen of England did during this era, right? They were building empires, right? So during this era, linguistically, czar meant from meaning king to meaning emperor, linguistically. Uh, which is interesting, and it speaks a lot there. Uh, here we have a notable czar is Ivan the Terrible, who was said to have, uh, there's a, a large castle in the Kremlin known as St. Basil's Cathedral, and uh, St. Basil's is uh, kind of like the picture of Russia, right, with those big swirly uh, bell-shaped towers, right, that's St. Basil's Cathedral. Uh, Ivan the Terrible, uh, was said to have, uh, after the architect was done building that building, gouged out the eyes of the art architect so that he could never build anything as beautiful ever again, right? He was an intense dude. Um, here we have uh, Peter the First, also known as Peter the Great. Uh, Peter the Great brought Russia into the modern era. He also uh, created the Russian Navy. He said Russia needs a Navy, basically. Here we have Catherine the Great, uh, Catherine the Great was the only Tsaritsa. Uh, she was the uh, female Tsar in the mid 1800s, making her a one of the very first uh, female uh, global uh, leaders. Uh, very notable. Um, and if you ever read anything into uh, Catherine the Great's personal life, uh, especially uh, the sexuality of it, um, most of those are historic lies because, of course, she was a woman, so they were making up sexual lies about her. And then uh, here we have uh, Tsar Nicholas II, uh, who was the last Tsar of Russia. Uh, he was basically uh, considered historically utterly incompetent, and that's a large reason why the Russian Revolution happened. So uh, in 1917, the Russian Empire was inten in intensely bad shape. This was due to political destabilization, uh, due to multiple revolutions that occurred over a 20 year period, right? So there was a lot of political upheaval happening in uh, Russia, ranging from 1890 to about uh, 1917, right? There were multiple revolutions. There were multiple assassination attempts. There, were, they, there was a lot of stuff going on. Um, there was a general poverty in Russia during this era. It was a very, very bad time to be a working class or poor person. And as a matter of fact, people were so poor that there wasn't really a working class. There were just all poor people effectively. The only real difference there was whether you were an urban poor person or a rural poor person. If you were an urban poor person, you were working in a factory. If you were a rural poor person, you were working uh, on a farm. And that's where the hammer and sickle symbol comes from in uh, the Russian communists because the, it was a unification of the urban poor person who held a hammer and the rural poor, poor person who held a sickle because a sickle is what you used to farm, right? It was, it was a show of the tools of the people, right? Um, a corruption within the government and aristocracy. The government of late era Russian empire was intensely corrupt intensely, intensely corrupt. Um, you could get whatever you wanted through bribery effectively. And they did whatever basically they want. They wasted tax dollars almost perpetually. 
<laughs> and uh, finally, really the linchpin on Imperial Russia was war wariness due to World War I. This is really the thing that wore through their society to the point where it collapsed in on itself. Um, they were at war uh, in World War I for two years and their uh, political uh, leadership, their, the uh, Tsar Nicholas in specific, was so incompetent on a military level that uh, soldiers, they just started, they just left. Right, they they just they just started in the hundreds, just walking the fuck home. Basically, is what they did because they could, because they weren't overseas. They could just walk three hundred miles that way and be home, and that's what they did. Um, so, in the year nineteen seventeen, there were, I told you I knew a lot about Russian history. In the year nineteen seventeen, there were two revolutions that occurred in Russia. There were actually two Russian revolutions that happened in the same damn year. Um, the February Revolution, which actually occurred in March, because the Eastern Orthodox calendar, um, this is something I haven't talked about at all, uh, there are a there's a different type of Christianity in Russia, right, which uses a different calendar, and according to that Eastern Orthodox Christian calendar, uh, basically when the February Revolution occurred, they called it February, we call it March. Uh, this February revolution was marked by mass desertions of the army. The army just said, screw this, we're walking home, and they just did in the thousands. They just started leaving. Um, also, during this time, the czar was removed from power. So there were, and here's actually a picture of some kids standing behind, beside like a decapitated head of uh, the czar who was in power, right? Um, during times of upheaval, we see statues get knocked down, right? Does this look familiar? It's because that's what people do. And when, when they get pissed off with statues, they knock them over. Um, there were mass protests too, large, large protests. Hundreds of people, hundreds of starving working class people coming together. And this ended in the forming of this government they called the provisional government. It was called the provisional government, probably would have been called something else eventually, but it was actually only in power for about nine months before the next revolution occurred. In, Oct in the October revolution, which occurred in November, uh, this is the one known as the Bolshevik revolution. So this was the second revolution to occur in 1917. This is the capital C communist revolution. Now in this, in the February revolution, there were also communists in that revolution, but they weren't, they weren't the whole damn thing, right? Um, so this October revolution, also known as the Bolshevik revolution, these Bolshevik communists, overthrew the other political groups in the provisional government, right? So what they did was basically, and the Bolsheviks were a large force in the first place. They had control over the most of the military forces. They were the most people, and they basically said, enough is enough. You're not doing anything. We're in, t in charge now. Tough shit right, is we, we got all the guns. It's really what, what happened and how it went down. Um, so they overthrew the other political groups. Uh, the Bolsheviks were definitely a markedly more reactionary, aggressive group. So in July of 1918, they just executed the royal family. The provisional government in the February Revolution, they removed the czar and they put him somewhere else. The Bolsheviks came in and shot him in the head in a basement specifically. Really, really horrible story. I'm not going to go into it, but it was, it was bad and ugly. Um, it also established uh, Vladimir Lenin as the premier of the Soviet Union. The premier being uh, the leader of the Soviet Union putting into effect a political structure that he called the dictatorship of the proletariat, meaning that it is okay to have, and this is, again, I'm talking about his ideology, not necessarily my ideology or our ideology. He believed that the best way to take care of the working class people was to be a dictator. Because if I 
have their best intentions in mind and they don't necessarily know the whole picture, but I'm acting on their behalf, then I can serve them very well. Now, historically, if you look at the character of Lenin, if you look at what he wanted and what he desired and how, and you really try to get into his head in a historic sense, it's my opinion as someone that's learned too much about Russia over his life, I really sincerely believe that Lenin believed in it right he was trying his best to do the thing however lenin died in 1923 and after lenin died joseph stalin took power and stalin didn't give a shit about working people right so basically in the structure that lenin created of the dictatorship of the proletariat it enabled other uglier people to come in and basically do a lower scale genocide than what Hitler actually did, right? That's a common comparison when looking at the Soviet era and looking at Nazi Germany, uh, that they did something pretty similar to a genocide. It wasn't the same thing as what Hitler did, but Stalin absolutely did also kill millions of people uh, too, just in a, I guess, a less racist way, which is a really messed up way to think about it. Russian history is complex, right? It's super duper complex. Now, what did these Bolsheviks actually believe in? These are the things that they believed in, and on their surface, some of these things sound pretty good, right? Um, so the, the Bolsheviks believed that all political power, and I'm going to read through these. These are like kind of the core of what the Bolsheviks believed. And then I'll talk about how it didn't quite work. They believed that all political power should reside with the working class, that the working class and also people that we in America today would call the middle class, that that's where all of the political power should be. It should not be the rich people. They would say that the rich serve no purpose, right? They believed that the army and the police should be in direct control of the working class. So the common people should have control over basically the people who have the guns, right? And, and they, the, the working people should be the boss of the police. Uh, they believed in redistribution of wealth in society. So they specifically, the, the Bolsheviks specifically believed in seizing wealth from the super rich and giving that back to poor people, right? They believed that. They believed in seizure of the means of production from the owners to workers, right? So no longer would owners own factories, no longer would owners own McDonald's's, but the people working in those places would then own those places. Right? So imagine working at McDonald's and then uh, having a little uprising and executing the general manager, and now we own the McDonald's, right? That's kind of what they were doing. Um, and then abolition of colonial and imperial wars. The arguments that the Bolsheviks were making were very much of their era peace arguments, right? They were arguing that we shouldn't go to wars internationally anymore, which if you look at where eventually the Soviets got later in the 20th century, around the Vietnam War, the Korean War, all that stuff, uh, looks, looks and was very hypocritical. Now, if you're familiar at all with George Orwell's Animal Farm, you may be familiar really animal farm was an amazingly good book i believe it was written in the early 50s when Orwell wrote it and really picks apart you guys are there did i lose you we still here okay so animal farm basically picks this apart and the pigs are uh, in animal if you've read quick show of hands who's read animal farm some, okay, some people have read Animal Farm. So the pigs are effectively the leadership in control of within Animal Farm. And then eventually as the book goes on, uh, it's a parallel of uh, Soviet power, right? Um, the Soviet Union, it's, its major issue was that the government got too big, 
right? And as the government got too big and the government got too powerful, they basically replaced the rich people in society with people who worked in government, right? So instead of everyone being equal, you had a government in which if you, the, the people in government had all the power and they still weren't distributing that wealth to all the people. It just replaced one group of um, aristocrats for another. Does that make sense? It's really kind of how it went down. Um, and I, this is definitely something I could just talk about for hours on what that actually meant. Were they actually practicing socialism or communism in theory? Probably not, but all this stuff. Anyway, now that Bolshevik revolution, going back to 1923, the Bolshevik revolution started a civil war that lasted from 1917 to 1923. The Bolsheviks, Bolshevik means in Russian, Bolshevik means big party. It's what it means. It means we the people, their version of we the people kind of, the big party, right? And then the Mensheviks were, were the little party. So the Bolsheviks were red Russians and the Mensheviks were the white Russians. Very similar to the drink. That's where the name comes from. Um, the Bolsheviks had, they were made up of farmers and peasants, right? That was the mass of the working class of that era. And also they had the military as well, and they were the guys with the guns, so that was useful. Um, the Mensheviks had the support of the remaining military officers, right? So they were able to conduct this war because they had basically the really highly trained military minds, but the Bolsheviks had most of the soldiers, right? So obviously that war didn't last forever. Uh, the Mensheviks were a uh, mixed coalition of traditional groups, and so like very conservative people, people that wanted to put the king back, the, the czar back in power, and people who today would be considered moderate Democrat, right, in, in uh, American society terms. Like it was a pretty broad coalition. The Bolsheviks were, um, while more people, uh, if, in terms of politics, more uh, extreme to the left, if you will. Uh, the Soviet Union uh, lasted from 1917 to 1991, uh, so uh, not quite 100 years, just about almost 80 years, not even. Uh, you might not know that during World War II, uh, 9 million uh, military personnel died uh, from Russia. Uh, in comparison, uh, in Germany, only 6 million people died and they, six million military personnel, more about, I think about 30 million Germans died and about a hundred mil, uh, uh, not a hundred, a whole lot more Russians died. Uh, in comparison, in the United States in World War II, only uh, 400, only, only four, 470,000 uh, Americans died, right? So uh, the mass of uh, Russian deaths in World War, uh, of deaths in World War II were Russian. Uh, that in part had to do with the military tactics of that era. Uh, as I mentioned, Joseph Stalin had very little um, respect for uh, life and Russian life. Uh, his main military, um, his main military strategy was to basically throw bodies at it, right? That's how he did it. Uh, if you've seen the movie, uh, there's a movie called Enemy at the Gates that is about the battle of, uh, I think it's the battle of um, Stalingrad, I believe, because of course Stalin renamed a city after himself. Well, the battle of Stalingrad in the beginning of that movie of Enemy at the Gates, there is a scene where Russian soldiers are terrified to run into battle. And there is this general barking, the first man has the gun, the second man follows the first man. When the first man dies, the second man takes his gun. And, the, the, and that was the only briefing they had for that battle, right? Basically, the guns were more valuable than the actual soldiers were. And that was kind of the military strategy of Russia during World War II. And honestly, 
the Nazis very well may have won World War II, if not for the Russians. In Russia, they don't call it World War II. They actually call it the Great Patriotic War because it has that kind of elevation to it. Um, the, uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. the Soviet Union was actually a collection of Russia and smaller nations. So this red one here, that is Russia itself. But all of these other color colored countries down here, these are all of the other countries that made up the Soviet Union that were not um, were not actually Russian. Uh, so this is it's a really significant uh, portion, uh, but most of it was Russia. It just gives a feel for the dynamics of Russia. Uh, you might not also know the word Soviet roughly translates to trade union or workplace, which really speaks to the ideology of the era. Uh, in theory, the way it was put together, the way Lenin put it together, is that the Soviet Union was supposed to be a massive collection of workplace unions that would rule the country. And then later, they had the idea to rule the world, right? Because uh, Lenin had this idea of, well, let's make all of this a communist thing. And then later on in um, the ideology of the Soviet Union, they started to be, well, we're going to liberate the world from capitalism. How do we liberate the world from capitalism? We are gonna spread communism everywhere. And uh, that, that was actually kind of a minor part of the ideology itself, but it's absolutely something that politicians in the United States grabbed onto and said, you see there, you see there, they're trying to take over, you see that, right? So it, it was really grabbed onto. And then in the dynamics of the Cold War, it spiraled out of control to the point where the Korean War started and then North Korean War, and then uh, the Vietnam War started, and we get these proxy wars and get these arms built up, et cetera. Um, yeah, there's my kids screaming upstairs. Um, the Soviet Union, uh, we often abbreviated it as USSR in the Russian language. Uh, the, uh, it, it looks like CCCP. Uh, in Russian, it actually would be said SSSR. SSSR. I can't roll my R's. It should be that. That is an R, and it should be rolled. Uh, it lasted from 1917 to 1991. Uh, the Soviet Union was notorious for bureaucracy, as I mentioned pre previously, and the bureaucrats replaced the aristocracy in Russian society. As I said more clumsily a couple minutes ago, the more people had, more people did have privilege but many did not, right? So if you really look objectively at the history of Russia, it was a lot better to be a poor person in Russia during the era of the Soviet Union than it was underneath the czars. Because the czars, the Soviet, the Soviet bureaucracy didn't care much about the people, but the czars absolutely didn't care about the people. And at least the Soviet bureaucracy pretended to care about people, which is the thing, right? So internationally, it would have looked bad um, if the, the bureaucrats in the Soviet Union just let people starve to death, which they kind of did. Um, but uh, under the, the reign of the czars, they, they really did not care if people starved to death. Um, Economic planning made some goods hard to come by. So remember, they were not capitalists, right? So they did not go by concepts of supply and demand. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, uh, I think, next week when we talk about economies. But their economy was driven in a very different way. So instead of looking at what people were buying, they were looking at what they anticipated people needed right? And in this era, in the 1920s and 1930s, that was really, really hard to do. So you can't really see it on the slide that well. This massive black, these are people, right? Standing in a very long line. And these were the notorious bread lines in the Soviet Union. Uh, there were also often lines for shoes and other things that were needed for living, basically. 
Um, these bread lines were not unheard of in, uh, in uh, the Soviet Union, but they weren't nearly as bad as American propaganda made it out to be. Um, it wasn't really an everyday kind of thing, but it was definitely something that was kind of part of life. Um, and you can also make comparisons today uh, that uh, every time like a new shoe comes out or a new iPods come out, oh, people wait in lines. And certainly uh, today with uh, COVID lines and all that stuff, like it's, that's more comparable to what it was like in the later eras of the Soviet Union. Uh, the, this picture is from about 1920 or 1930. Uh, this kind of very long bread line didn't really exist in the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s. It did, but it wasn't like this. It was, yeah, like I said, more like COVID grocery store lines today. Um, uh, other notable things about the Soviet era, uh, the Cold War started in 1947. Uh, most of the actual military uh, stuff of the Cold War uh, centered around a military arms race with the United States and that focused on nuclear weapons. Uh, there were tanks, there were submarines built and all that stuff, but it really uh, focused on nuclear warheads. You see in this first part of the Cold War, uh, during the 50s and 60s, the United States really ramped up their production. Historically, during this era, we were saying in our American propaganda that the Soviets were kicking our butts in terms of uh, technology and especially in terms of uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, we were saying that, but it simply wasn't true. Then, and I, on my, can you guys see like a blue in this area and then it's more pink? Okay, I can't see that. I know it's there, but I can't see it. I'm just gonna point where I think it is. You'll note right here at about 1980, uh, this is part, partially due to the Carter administration uh, cutting back on uh, military spending, especially nuclear spending, and then it continues to go down. But our rhetoric was that we were building more and more and more. While at the same time, the Soviet, they, actually had some military advancements where they became capable of building a whole lot more and they built a whole lot more nuclear weapons and that peaked in about yeah about 1989 and then it drops real fast well that's because in 1991 that's when the soviet union stopped right uh there are many analyses that this spike in spending billions of dollars on nuclear weapons took the already fragile economy of the Soviet Union and just tanked it, right? Um, and probably Jimmy Carter didn't have that intention, right? But uh, of, low, of lowering ours and then that spiking, but absolutely that was a tactic of the Reagan administration. Uh, and well, there isn't a Soviet Union anymore. So, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and was replaced by the Russian Federation at that time. Um, highlights of the Russian Federation. Uh, the 1990s were highly uh, economically volatile in Russia. So what was happening was they were going from a state controlled by, they were going from state controlled capitalism effectively, right? So they weren't really truly communist anymore at that time. They more were doing capitalism as if the state were in control. And then they went to straight laissez faire, no rules, do whatever you want capitalism. And that really hurt a lot of people very bad. Uh, but many business people made boatloads of money, almost literal boatloads of money. And many common people during this era became much, much poorer due to the collapse of social services. Um, and so to be poor in the Soviet Union in the 80s, everyone was poor basically, but the poorest were much better off than in the Russian Federation era. 
Uh, most people in Russia today are probably better off than they were during the Soviet era, but the poorest of society were not. Um, this is actually reflected in modern Russian politics uh, because uh, the second, uh, the main opposition party to Vladimir Putin's, I think it's called the United Russian Party, uh, are communists. The communist party is still alive and well in Russia, and they're actually the second party in Russia. Uh, the, but the fact of the matter is that Putin's party is uh, very much in strongly in control. And we're going to look at that in a second. Uh, some weapons were sold or stolen during the 90s uh, in uh, Russia. The exact number is not known, but there were at least hundreds of nuclear weapons sold out of the Russian arsenal, and they just kind of disappeared. Um, really pretty scary if you start thinking about it. Uh, the modern Russian military in 2020 is more like locked down and that's not really happening much anymore, but there's still a lot of Soviet era uh, nuclear weapons that are still unaccounted for. Uh, this was made possible by extreme corruption, corruption in the military in the late era Soviet Union, including blah, 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 I said all that. Uh, this created massive uncertainty in the late 90s, early 2000s. And this is reflected in some of the concerns of the war on terror era uh, in, um, in the United States, right? Because we're talking about nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons, where are all the nuclear weapons? Who's building nuclear weapons? Well, that kind of paranoia of that era was absolutely also the effect of not knowing where all the goddamn nukes were from the 1990s, right? Like, yeah, it was, it was a paranoia we had, justifiably so. Uh, Post-Soviet Russia has not exactly been democratic, right? Our major criticism of the Soviet Union was it was anti-democratic. So we removed communism, and since then, Russia has not been democratic. Uh, Boris Yeltsin uh, was president of the Russian Federation uh, from, yeah, it says here, uh, 1991 to December 1999. So he was president for eight years. Then our buddy Vladimir Putin came into control uh, in 2000, and he was president from 2000 to 2008. Then, if you know anything about Russian history, you would know uh, about Russian politics, you would know this really should be three pictures of Putin right here. Because Dmitry Medvedev became president of Russia and he made Putin during this era his prime minister, which is basically the prime minister of Russia is basically a supercharged vice president, right? So uh, it went from Putin being in control to Putin's lackey being in control to Putin being in control again. Effectively, dude has been in charge for about 20 years. And he has been in a significant position of power since the mid-1980s, actually, because in the mid-1980s, he was director of the KGB, which is the Soviet, which was the Soviet CIA, and then they became the FSA, which is basically still the CIA. Um, so yeah, Putin was also the head of the, he, he he's done some, some nasty shit. Really, oof. Is the only way I can put it. Um, these so, additionally, um, this whole corruption thing and Russian politics and the way Russian politics work in the modern era, the post-Soviet era, it is very similar, actually, to also the imperial and medieval era, eras of Russia as well, right? So people who are apologists for the Soviet communists often make the argument, well, communism never really had a chance in Russia because the nature of Russian society is that of in almost inherent corruption and just kind of the way they do stuff. Now, that's, it's not a good argument because it is semi-racist against Russians actually. But it is definitely like not entirely invalid either, 
right? Because there is something to the Russian mindset of, well, if you, to get what you want, you do have to pay some bribes here and there, right? I actually, um, next time I teach this, I'm going to get a scan of a guidebook that I have uh, from the Soviet Union. Uh, it's a it's an English language guidebook to that you would use in the 1980s to um, uh, go to the Soviet Union, and there is a good page and a half on there on how to bribe police officers. It's wild. It's really it's pretty wild stuff. Um, but yeah, and that still happens in some places. If you ever go to Russia today, um, you it's a good idea to keep some extra money in your pocket. Uh, in case a cop asks to see your papers uh, and takes your wallet and doesn't give it back. Like, that's, that's for real. And that's not just Russia. That's other places, too. Okay. The language itself, though. Let's talk a little bit about the Russian language itself. Um, the English language has 26 letters. Uh, the Russian Cyrillic alphabet, because we have a Latin alphabet, the C Cyrillic alphabet has 32 letters. Uh, most of those extra letters are made up of extra E's. So here is uh, the letter Y and then the letter Yo. They basically do a lot of the sound. It, it, it's an it's a E with a Y in front of it, basically. It's a, as in uh, Yelka, uh, which means Christmas tree. Um, so these are basically two letter E's. And then we have another E right here. And then we have another E. And then this is a silent E, this one. So what the letter E does when it's silent, well, they have a specific letter for that. Uh, and then that's it for E's. But then this letter, oh, here, no, wait, here's another E, right? No, that's a Z. And then there's a U, and then there's another U, and then there's a Z sound, and then another Z sound, and then sh, and then sh, it, it's a very complicated language. Um, so compare our language here, and you will note that there is a heavy layover between the Latin alphabets and the uh, Cyrillic alphabet, though. There are a lot of sound letters that look very similar, right? Uh, but then there are letters that don't. There's this letter. This letter doesn't really look like anything in the English language. Uh, neither does this letter or this letter. But if we look at Asian languages, uh, this is a part of the Chinese alphabet, you will see a little bit more similarity there, right? Especially with zhe and then, then she and shu. Uh, a little bit with yu and u. And this one's called Miyaki's Knock. Anyway, um, you see that by comparing these, really the Russian language is very, the letters specifically, is a combination of European letters and Asian letters. And, you know, if you look out on a, on it, on a map, Russia is in between Asia and Europe. Uh, and that's very much actually a part of what it means to be Russia, is to be in between Europe and Asia. Um, other things about the Russian language, specifically relating to gender, uh, Russian words are male, female, or neuter. Uh, not every language that has a gender case has this uh, neutral case to it. Uh, Russian does. Uh, there is no consistency in what words are male or female, just like in many other languages that have that gender element to it. Uh, but there is definitely uh, male dominance uh, in certain areas uh, more, and this is a lot to do with traditional Russian society, uh, mechanical words, um, business words, warfare words, those tend to be more male more often than uh, female words tend to be more domestic and relating to the home. Uh, it's not all the time, but it's relatively common. Um, yeah. Uh, other fun facts about the Russian language, uh, the royal rulers of Russia, uh, the word should not be spelled C-Z-A-R, it should actually be spelled Tsar, uh, T-S-A-R, 
uh, because uh, it, you, it's spelled with this letter right here, that's S. Uh, you actually spell it S, E, R, and uh, so yeah, so anyway, C-Z-A-R is bullshit. Um, there is no word for the in the Russian language, uh, which is kind of weird for those of us who are predominantly English uh, to think of. Um, there is just no word the. And then once you know that and you, I mean, the is everywhere, right? And that is a weird thing uh, to uh, deal with Russian. Uh, this whole slide is all the reasons why I will never be fluent in Russian. Uh, in the English language, there are three cases. There's the instrumental case, the accusative case, and the possessive case, right? In Russian, there are six cases. The nominative case, the genitive case, the dative case, the accusative case, the instrumental case, and the propositional case. What the hell does that mean? Well, um, effectively, uh, Effectively, what it means is they have a lot more rules in their language than we in English speaking have in our language in ways that like It's real hard to even wrap the head around right um, and, and that again talks back to superior wharf hypothesis and then another fun thing I like about the, the Russian language is that when they say it's snowing, it translates literally to the snow walks, which is just kind of a fun little thing. Okay, well, and that is uh, just about where my, um, my presentation craps out on us. So that's fun. Uh, so that is it uh, for this week. Uh, don't forget to uh, do the paper on uh, gender and language. Uh, do the quiz uh, that covers a lot of the material uh, here uh, today. I, I got that quiz finalized this morning. Uh, it should be up and ready for you to go. Are there any questions on anything before we're done? How many questions are on the quiz? How many questions are on the what? On the quiz. The quizzes are five questions each. Just five questions. Every quiz, every one of those quick quizzes, only five questions. So it says you, like, and that's, that's very intentional. So uh, the quick quizzes, you only have 10 minutes, but it's only five questions. So I think that's a pretty reasonable amount of time for that. Anything else? No? Okay. Uh, I am satisfied with this evening, if you are. Um, next week is going to be, if I remember correctly, economics. Uh, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that socialist stuff and communist stuff too, um, which is also interesting. Okay, so that is it for the week. Um, if you have any back work, any assignments you missed, please let me know. Uh, we can try to fix that too. I want everyone to get a good grade because if we're going to have COVID, at least we're going to get good grades. Okay. So I'll see you guys later. Keep wearing those masks. Be safe, please. Yes. Bye-bye.